Hey, I'm so glad you're joining us again today. We're continuing in our series at Central Heights this summer called Words to Live By. And today our special guest is Darley Ann. And I know she's our kids pastor, so the kids know her really well, but maybe some of you don't. And this will give you a great window into the amazing person that she is. So welcome, Darley Ann. And uh, we'd love to hear some things about, you know, who you are, what makes you tick. Why don't we go all the way back to childhood? <laughs> Where did you grow up and what did that look like? Sure. Um, I was born in Kelowna and then we quickly moved to Alberta. So I grew up in a little town or at the time it was a little town called Sylvan Lake. More people know about it now. Is that outside of Calgary? Uh, it's between Calgary and Edmonton. Okay. I might even have known where that was. Yeah. So Sylvan Lake, tiny little town, uh, lived between there and Red Deer. Uh, and spent a little bit of time in Edmonton too because that's where my dad's whole family is from. Uh, and then when we were eight, we moved out to BC. Um, and we've been out here between, well, in the Fraser Valley somewhere um, mm -hmm. ever since. So, um, yeah, it's uh, not much to say there, actually. Not um, a lot of moving. Siblings? I have one brother. Yeah, okay. I have one brother. He's three years older than me. Um, Did he but, treat you well? <laughs> he did treat me well. Okay. We actually, many people confused us for twins. We were mm. always by each other's sides. Um, we ha happened to just have this sense when something was wrong with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and that carried into adulthood too, where we would just call each other or text each other when we felt something was wrong. Oh, so I've had a very unique and awesome friendship with my brother cool. growing up. And what did you love doing as a kid? What sort of took your interest? <sighs> yeah, I think... Uh, anything to keep up with my brother. Uh, so I would have been deemed a tomboy for sure as, mm -hmm. a, as a kid because, I mean, I wore dresses on Sundays, but during the week, mm -hmm. if it was the train tracks, if it was the, the bike park, wherever my brother was going, I mm -hmm. wanted to go and hang out with them. Yeah. So um, anything outdoors has always been a huge interest of mine. Animals I've always loved. Mm -hmm. Find a stray cat, bring it home. Okay. My parents didn't always like that, but right, you know. Right, right. Um, but anything to cuddle and comfort and yeah. Have fun. Sweet. Yeah. Now, I know you're going to tell us more a little bit about, you know, your upbringing and whatnot, sure. but so you graduated from high school, hmm. then what sort of path did your, your life take after that? Yeah, you know, God was really gracious to me. He gave me lots of opportunities to try out different things <clears throat> I loved. Mm -hmm. uh, so while I was doing university, I got to work at Greater Vancouver Zoo. Um, I loved animals and I got to work alongside okay. them. And I got to Like leave. right on 264? Yep, okay. the one on 264. All right. Yeah, so um, between leading educational tours for kids, driving the train, which I actually had to get my engineer's license to drive. Really? Uh, yeah, it's expired okay. now, but right. uh, I had it. Um, so driving the train, doing the tours, of course you get a lot of interaction with the animals while mm -hmm. you're there, mm -hmm. holding baby lions when we had no. them. Well, it's pretty awesome. You stay away from the hippopotamus? <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of stories about the hippos, oh. but uh, yeah, no, they were a lot of fun too. Okay. Um, so yeah, we went from working at the zoo to pursuing my studies in environmental science. I've okay. loved the environment since mm -hmm. I was little, I'd want to do my best to try and create or protect God's per uh, beautiful creation yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I did a degree in environmental protection technology mm -hmm. uh, and worked for a consulting firm uh, for uh, a while uh, or a lab first actually I like big picture I like to mm -hmm. see it all from the lab yeah. side yeah. to the consultant side where you're actually taking the soil samples uh, so I worked on the Olympic Village job site, Falls Creek, right there on really? the water for eight months. Uh, that was my job site. You're kidding. Um, yeah, wow. I worked on remediation and cleaning that so we could actually put that apartment building there. So what years, what years would that have been? Oh, well, that would be two years before Olympics because they had to, that, that I was there. Okay. Um, because then they had to have enough time to build the building. Do you know when I lived in Vancouver, mm -hmm. I used to walk that area and pray through it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Space. It's, it's amazing beautiful. what they've done. Yeah. yeah. It was very toxic at the time, mm -hmm. but now it's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. yeah. So obviously that prepares you for kids ministry, you know, <laughs> working with environments. You got to set the right environments right? for kids. So like, how did that sort of... Yeah. Again, God continued to meander and move me. Um, I feel blessed to have every job that I've had along mm -hmm. the way. Um, Full-time uh, environmental work is busy, means long hours, means a lot of time away from home. Uh, and uh, when Andrew and I met and when we got married, we realized that was not the family life we wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were looking to switch gears anyways. And the first thing that God switched gears was he gave us our photography company. Um, okay. And Andrew and I 
side by side, uh, did uh, ran a photography company for almost 11 years. Really? Um, yeah. And then in the midst of that, working, he was still a teacher, I was still doing environmental consulting, trying to figure out how to balance photography as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then God started to call me into ministry, which mm -hmm. Like you're just saying, it doesn't seem like this path is uh, mm -hmm. lining up quite right. Mm -hmm. uh, but when God calls you, you know. Yeah. Uh, you have a peace. Yeah. Uh, you have a peace that no matter how you've prepared yourself for where you think you're supposed to be, it's okay to let go of it and mm -hmm. try something mm -hmm. different. And so I wanted to honor that and uh, let go of environmental consulting and came into kids ministry at North Langley Community okay. Church. So that was your entry point? That was my entry point. Into kids ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, how do you, how do you, do you like it? <laughs> do you not like it? <laughs> uh, I, I love it. Okay. I feel very blessed to be able to do what mm -hmm. I do today. Um, God has definitely had a hand in this whole path. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was there at North Langley for just four and a half, almost four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And now I've been here at Central Heights for, we're getting into over five years. Amazing. So um, God is good. He is uh, faithful. And uh, I'm insanely honored to be able yeah. to do the job I do. Yeah, it's great. We love how you love our kids <laughs> and the person that you are. Thank you. I want to know a little bit more about how you met Andrew. <laughs> Uh, so I met Andrew at our the, the church that we were both attending at the time. Okay. I had grown up there. That was my home church. So mm -hmm. when it's a smaller church of about 300 people and somebody new comes in, you notice when mm -hmm. someone new comes in. Uh, and we were both on the worship team together. Um, convenient. Convenient, right? <laughs> uh, and so I know he'll laugh at this when he hears this. I picked new guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we shared the same group of friends uh, mm -hmm. very early on, which was, mm -hmm. was awesome. And uh, yeah, being able to serve alongside each other and see that we had similar hearts and passions in those areas mm -hmm. uh, was an easy starting point for our That's relationship. Yeah. yeah, And obviously it led to marriage and yeah. you've got two boys. Two boys, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have got Aiden and Nathan. How old are they? Uh, Aiden is 13, Nathan is 11. I can't believe I have a high schooler this fall. Isn't that incredible it's how gone fast, fast that happened? <laughs> It's gone wow. really fast, wow. um, but they are they are amazing little gifts. Wow. So uh, I'm blessed to be their mom. So good. And I have to say, I love the way I see you parent your kids. Aww. So I think it really models well for our, our church family. So Thanks. so good. Darlene, at some point in your life, Jesus, you know, became central. Um, yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, I. I am lucky to say that uh, I grew up in a Christian household, mm -hmm. uh, and so he grabbed a hold of my heart pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And for the way our home dynamic was, which we'll we'll hear about in just a minute, mm -hmm. um, I grabbed a hold of his heart really early on too. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was just such an amazing gift to be a kid, no matter what was going on, to say I had the comfort and peace, and I felt the love. Um, from God mm. so early, and uh, I really just clung on to that mm. and, and held on to it. And I'm grateful that I've been able to hold on to it mm. for, for my life so mm. far. So, Was there every time where you sort of strayed from that relationship once you started, or did, was it pretty consistent? I'd say in the most part it was pretty consistent. Mm. I'd say there was a few teenage years while I was watching everybody around me kind of make their own paths and decisions where, for me, it felt like straying a little bit, but it still wasn't... Mm. It wasn't a complete disconnect. It was, all right, you know, I might go and hang out with this group of friends and then question it afterwards. Should I have question, right. hung out with that group yeah. of friends? Um, so no, I've, I've, for the most part, my brother has not, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, but I have um, stayed close. Oh, yeah, that's a beautiful testimony. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're gonna be talking today. We get to hear from you about a verse that's really impacted your life. We're looking forward to how you share that with us and uh, God bless you as you do. Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody, the passage that I have for you, the one that has been my life verse since I was little, is Jeremiah 29, 11. I know many of you may know this one. Uh, some of you may even have it written down somewhere in your house. Um, and it has been one that has stuck with me since I was a little kid. So this morning, I want to take some time to share with you my story. I know you heard a little bit of my history when I was talking with Tim, but I want to share and elaborate a little bit more on that and then dive into why Jeremiah 29, 11 sometimes gets taken out of context, which means we need to look at the context. We need to look at the background of Jeremiah and when it was written. 
And then I want to look at those two things and help explain why, or hopefully it's evident, <laughs> why this verse means so much to me. So let's start with reading Jeremiah 29, 11. Grab your Bibles. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, before I jump into my story, I just want to take a mo quick moment to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way your word is written and is alive for us today. God, we thank you for the way that you speak into our lives, how you guide us, how you've molded us, how you have chosen each one of us. Lord, I ask that you help us today to see this passage uh, for your heart's desire, the way you intended it to be, uh, how it can apply to our lives. And God, I ask that how I share my story today, how if it can encourage someone, if it can um, walk alongside and bring comfort for someone today. Uh, God, I ask that, um, yeah, you use that for your glory. Uh, so Lord, be with us in this time as we dive into Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, we thank you. We thank you so much for this beautiful passage um, and the way that you have guided us since the very first, first words of this Bible in Genesis um, and in your creation, God. Thank you for the way you guide us. And uh, Lord, just be with us in this time. Amen. All right, so before we dive into Jeremiah 29 a bit further, my story. So like you heard, I grew up in Alberta, but uh, I grew up in a Christian home, which I'm very blessed to say. It was an honor to be able to say I grew up with this book, well, a slightly smaller version of it in my tiny little hands. Uh, I grew up with this book in my hands. Um, my grandparents were ministers, so every summer when we'd go visit them, we would spend summer at church. Um, my aunt and uncle were missionaries in Africa. I have cousins that are still missionaries. I have other cousins that have joined me in pastoral ministry. Uh, so we have a family of roots uh, in the word, which is, it, which is beautiful. As a family, we attended church every Sunday morning. It was a day you went to church. You went in the morning, you gathered with your community in the afternoon, and you went back for evening service. Yes, evening service, morning and night, two services on Sundays every week, even through the summer. All right. So showed a little commitment. It was, uh, it, was, it was our life. We served through the church whatever way we could, whatever, wherever there was a gap in volunteers, we jumped in as a family. Now, I loved that part. I loved serving the church, and I loved being at the church. Now, I might have painted a pretty awesome picture of what our home life looked like, but there's more to share. So what people didn't see was behind the doors at home. We kind of lived a double life. I grew up in an abusive household. My father was physically and emotionally abusive. Whew, sorry. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy being a kid, reading this word and hearing about a God who loves you and cares for you, has a plan for you, a hope and a future, and being afraid to go home. To hear the joy. I love being at church because that's where I heard about love and compassion and care and forgiveness. And I didn't always feel that when I walked into my, my doors at home. So it was a struggle. I am so grateful that God grabbed hold of my heart when I was a kid. And even through what I was going through at home, I knew that there was a God who loved me. There was a God who had a plan for me. There was a God who chose me. Me. I still struggle with that some days. I don't feel worthy of that some days. But I am grateful that I knew those words and I knew those truths as a kid going through what I was going through at home, that he was the one that was going to carry me through. Now, when I was 12, things had gotten kind of rough. And so my dad and my brother, oh, sorry, my mom and my brother and I, we left. We, didn't, we knew we needed to leave, but we didn't know what we were about to face. Our friends and our family were divided on whether or not they wanted to support us because in the Bible, they didn't see abuse as a reason for divorce. So then as a kid, I had another struggle. What I'm reading here about a God, his character, his love, his compassion, his mercy, wasn't what I was seeing from fellow believers in the church. It was hard, but it's a part of our journey that we walk through. 
seven years of having my parents not sit in the same room, of um, animosity, of separate Christmases and birthdays, and nothing quite lining up the way it looked like a lot of my friends' lives were lining up. It wasn't, again, easy. I never once, if I am completely honest, I never once prayed in those seven years that God was going to work a miracle, restore my family. We were going to have that beautiful picture that everybody else had because I didn't think that was possible for us. And yet I totally believe in a God of miracles. But from what I grew up in, it didn't seem like things could change. But seven years after we left my dad, a letter was written. To be honest, I don't remember if it was my mom to my dad or my dad to my mom, but there was an apology letter that was written and it started a conversation. My parents met and went for, and had coffee together. Two months later, they announced to us that they're getting remarried. The impossible just happened. The unimaginable to me just happened. My parents were gonna get remarried. They had both done divorce care. They had both walked through their journeys and God had worked a miracle and restored their hearts and restored a love for one another that they had. The joke in our family is that they had to get married twice to figure it out that they were actually meant to be together. Uh, but now they have a relationship that they would have never had had we had stayed together the first time. They let God do a miracle for them. God restored our family. So Jeremiah 29, 11, let's jump back into this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I'm lucky to say that no matter what I faced as a kid, no matter the journeys I went through, I felt that hope in future. Though when I was young, I didn't understand the words of restoration and that God's big plan was to send his son to die on a cross and create a way for us to have perfect harmony with him in heaven. I might not have understand, understood that full picture as a young kid. In my heart, I had a peace and an assurance that God was going to carry us through. God was going to have a bigger picture plan. So let's look at Jeremiah here. Now, background to Jeremiah, he was a prophet. Again, not everybody knows today, like you say prophet, it sounds kind of weird. Well, they were foretelling um, of things to come. But more importantly, they were telling, they were actually using God's words. God was speaking through them. And so what is penned here in the book of Jeremiah is uh, God's words through the prophet Jeremiah to the nation of Israel. Now, that's an important thing to, to notice there. Our context is that Jeremiah is actually speaking to, or God through Jeremiah, I should say, is speaking to Israel, his chosen people. He gave them the promised land. And then here we are in chapter 29. This letter is written on the basis of this, uh, a group of them have been taken out to exile. It's not the place they wanted to be. They were struggling. We were your chosen people. Why are we putting put into exile? And yet we jump into verse 4 here, and, and Jeremiah is trying to give them some encouragement in their state of exile right now. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. So that, they, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Jeremiah is letting them know to, to settle, to take root where they are. It's going to be a journey, and they're going to be there for a while. Don't keep your bags packed. Get settled be useful and take heart. God is still with you. Pray to the Lord. Help him intercede for you in this place that you are. Let him give you comfort and guidance. In verse 10, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promises to bring you back to this place. Did you catch that? 70 years. He's not saying seven hours. He's not saying 70 weeks. He's saying 70 years. That means some of these people that had gone into exile with the age that they were, they were not getting back to the promised land. They were not getting back to Jerusalem. That might have been a hard pill to swallow, but he's telling them, rest easy, because that next verse is the one that people cling to often, the one that I clung to through many things that I went to, through. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan for us, but we need to be patient. God has a restoration plan in place for all of us. We need to be faithful. Seventy years, he asked them to be patient, to be faithful. Now, when some people look at Jeremiah 29, 11, they take it out of context, meaning that when God has a plan for them and a hope for them and a future for them, they think that whatever I hope for and I plan for now means God's going to provide it now. That's not what he's asking. That's not what he's saying in this word. That's not what Jeremiah wrote down here for us. We have to be patient. God's timing is always better than our timing. If I look at my childhood, did I... Could I imagine a shorter time period at home and maybe not experience everything that I experienced? Sure. Seven years of divorce and the things that we went through? Challenging, sure. But I have to say, it's a part of my story. I won't change it because God got to use it. And I'm hoping that God continues to use that through me. His, my story that I shared is 100% God's story. The way he's carried me, the way he's guided me. I think of the poem Footprints in the Sand, and there are seasons where I look back and I only saw one set of footprints, and I fully know on the other side of it now it was because he carried me. He is a provider. He will walk through the valleys with us. So no matter where you're at today, no matter what you've gone through, I hope that you find encouragement in this verse. Not that you're going to find restoration and healing in a split second, but that you can remain faithful to the one who created you, to the one who loves you, to the one who is alive in these words and is still alive for us today. So with all of this in mind, I have a challenge for you. I want you to this week think about whatever verse is your life verse. What would you call that verse what is that one that stands out to you? What is that one that stands a test of time that is the back of your mind when, when trouble comes, when, when hardship comes? What is that verse that helps you stand firm? If you've never taken the time to look into the context, the background, I encourage you this week to do that. But not just to take time to look into what it means. I would encourage you to share a bit of your story. Why does that verse mean something to you? whether it be around your dinner table with your family or you're out at a park with friends, take a moment, take an opportunity to share the story that God has given you, the way that God has carried you, guided you, whatever it may be for you. Share that story because you never know how that story could help somebody else, encourage someone else, or bring wisdom when you get to learn more about the God who loves us together. No matter what you face, no matter what you have faced, no matter the scars you carry, God is with you. He loves you, and he has a plan for you. Have a great week.